We have some really good updates for you on some progress we've made in a couple of areas of the, re uh, of the region on uh, program assistance for uh, low-income people. Um, and so without further ado, um, uh, John, can you, there you go. Um, so just want to make sure, I think everybody on this call probably knows who we are if you made it here, um, but uh, the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project, we are one of um, the specialty projects within the Legal Aid Network, um, uh, along with um, uh, some of the other uh, specialty projects, community justice projects, um, uh, uh, regional housing legal services, the health law project, institutional law project, and then of course North Penn um, and the other regional legal aid programs. We all uh, work together within the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network to make sure that low-income Pennsylvanians um, have basic uh, access to justice. Um, and so uh, our role within the Legal Aid Network, uh, making sure low-income people can connect and afford and to maintain utility service. So we do that in a number of ways is um, primarily we get involved in large-scale litigation before the Pennsylvania Utility uh, Commission on uh, various low-income issues, rate increases, universal service program design, other policy and lit uh, litigation topics. Um, but then we also have a huge portion um, of the work that we do is to provide training like this, to provide technical assistance to you all as you're uh, representing or assisting low-income people to connect and maintain utility service um, and support to uh, legal aid and nonprofit groups across Pennsylvania. So we do have a, a project that's focused in the Northeast. Um, and, uh, you know, the last three years, we've been working really hard on water access issues. Prior to that, we were working uh, with, with some folks I see on the call um, to improve uh, utility services for victims of domestic violence. Um, and so, you know, we're hoping to continue our work in the Northeast region in the next three years uh, to, to work uh, some with uh, immigration, immigrant populations in particular and rural communities in the Northeast on utility issues. So we'd love to connect with you on that, but let's uh, move slides. So we'll talk, I'm going to give you some updates on the moratorium. Uh, we're going to run through some assistance programs. Then I'm going to turn it over to John to talk us through lots of strategies on legal and regulatory um, uh, angles to protect people's rights to utility service. Uh, we'll end with some uh, tenant utility rights and uh, some time for question and answer at the end. So where are we right now? We are uh, just shy or just uh, under two weeks away from the end of both the COVID-19 emergency moratorium and the winter moratorium. So most of you probably know that the winter moratorium every year starts December 1st, ends March 31st, and it protects electric, gas, and heat-related water service from termination um, for those at or below 250% of the poverty level. Last March, uh, March 13th to be exact, the Commission, uh, the Public Utility Commission issued an emergency moratorium um, that uh, prevented any termination until last fall. Um, as of November 9th, the Commission put in a different paradigm going through winter, which was to protect protected customers, um, which was a new class that they created, uh, those with income at or below 300% of the poverty level, um, uh, if they applied for available assistance um, and they uh, agreed to a payment arrangement, they would be protected uh, from termination uh, through winter. That additional protection is now also going to end as of March 31st. The commission just ruled on this last week. And so we are in a position now where we are gearing up for uh, what we anticipate to be a wall of terminations coming at us. Um, this is in part because when the emergency moratorium went into place last March, the winter moratorium from 2019 was still in place. So really the first time that utilities can begin to terminate folks for non-payment uh, since December 2019 is going to be March 31st. So people have very large balances and there's a lot of them. Um, 
we some of you probably uh, are already seeing some termination notices come across um, the utilities are all at different stages some of them began issuing termination notices as of february 1st others will begin to issue termination notices in the next week or so some aren't planning to issue them until april comes um, it is important to note that any termination notice that was issued in February, even if the moratoriums were still in place, um, those are good for up to 60 days, which takes us to April 1st. So if somebody got a termination notice in February and ignored it and thought it would go away or that something would happen or that the protections were going to keep them from being terminated, the utilities can act on those termination notices as of April 1st. Let's go forward. So just a note about the scope. Um, this is as of the end of December. Um, there were approximately, and we're just talking right now about regulated utilities. There's also 1,200 unregulated municipal water authorities across the state. But in terms of regulated utilities, as of the end of December, there were roughly 850,000 Pennsylvania households uh, eligible for termination. Um, and debt was utility debt reached 812 million. That was up about 64% year over year. We have never seen numbers like this um, ever. Uh, so, you know, the closest it comes uh, was uh, during the housing crisis in 2008, um, roughly low income uh, utility consumers were terminated roughly at a rate of one, one in five um, through that period. Uh, oh, nearly 20% of low-income people um, uh, lost their service in that year. Um, the economic scale of, of the pandemic is far worse. Um, and of course, uh, utility moratorium, there's some research out now showing that the moratoria has worked to protect, um, you know, literally thousands of lives in Pennsylvania, about 7.4% reduced mortality rate because we had those moratoria in place. Um, and that translates to over 1,500 um, lives saved in Pennsylvania because of the moratorium. Um, so I'm going to dig right in because really the first line of defense um, uh, for the terminations that are coming is going to be matching people up with various utility assistance programs. So I'll hit a, on a lot of these. Um, uh, some of them have yet to really roll out. The first one I'll talk about is the emergency rental and utility assistance program. Um, it's going to be different in every county, but I'll also talk then about uh, the utility assistance programs that are available. Um, um, you know, through the utilities, some of the hardship funds, um, certainly LIHEAP, while it's still a resource, uh, we hope they'll extend the season, um, but uh, right now it's set to close April 9th, so we got to get everybody in for LIHEAP right away, um, and, uh, you know, a couple of other things we'll touch on uh, before turning to what the legal strategies are for uh, termination defense, but always first line, get them into an assistance program. So let's start with the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Um, and I'm sure some of you uh, may know even more about this than I do. Um, uh, we've been working pretty closely with DHS in the rollout for the state program, uh, but many of the counties that you all are living and working in got some direct allocation uh, from the federal government for this. This is the money that came in December um, from the federal package uh, that was passed uh, right around Christmas time. Um, roughly 277, almost 278 million went to counties with larger populations, um, of which there are many in the Northeast region. Um, about just just over or just under 570 million went uh, in block grants to each county um, based on population. So there's this mix of money. Um, uh, the eligibility is, you know, it's pretty straightforward. And I'm, we are hearing that some counties are putting additional restrictions on eligibility. Um, if that's happening, I think at the very least, it's something we'd want to let DHS know about. Um, and, you know, in advocacy at the local level, I think the message is 
we as Pennsylvania have to spend $90 million a month in order to not return money to the federal government. Uh, we want to get this relief out to the people that need it and putting more restrictions in place is only going to create a barrier uh, for folks getting access. Um, so eligibility is 80% of area median income. Um, we have a link in here uh, to DHS's website on the next slide that'll, that has a rundown of what every county AMI is for 80%. Um, so hopefully that'll be helpful as you try and see whether somebody is eligible for the programs. Um, there needs to be a reduction in income. Uh, uh, incurring substantial cost or a financial hardship as a result of COVID-19. Um, many counties have taken um, the approach that we've been supporting, which is that increased utility costs as a result of um, the pandemic is an impact that should be sufficient to meet this eligibility criteria. And if you guys are like me and have been home a lot more, um, you're running more electricity during the day, you're running more water because you'd never use anybody else's water. So, um, you know, everybody's utility bills across the board, residential utility usage is up um, quite a bit. Um, as a result of the pandemic. So we believe that's a, a sufficient hardship uh, with a nexus to the pandemic that should allow people to qualify for this assistance. The benefits, right? Uh, I'm not going to talk any in any detail about the rental assistance that that i'll leave to the housing experts um, but as far as utility assistance this can pay for arrears all the way back to march um, and so there's so, going to be some logistical issues getting the counties to be able to figure out how much utility debt uh, is from back to march and whether or not there's debt prior to march um, we've been talking with the utilities about how to how to work through this, um, but our advice to you would be uh, get on the phone to your county um, or to a contact at the utility. And if you need a direct contact at the utility, just shoot John or I an email and we will make sure that you make that connection to the person at the utility that it's going to be helpful to get you what that balance is, right? Because they're going to need to do some uh, uh, math to figure out how much it is you owe. Um, and it's available for electricity, gas, water, sewer, trash, and deliverable fuels. Um, there is now, and this is a, a recent change, um, but there is new guidance from the federal government allowing uh, counties to use some of their um, housing stability services funds. So up to 9% of the funds that went to the county can be used for broadband um, assistance or telecommunications assistance. So, um, you know, that was something that we worked with some of our national partners to get changed at the federal level. Um, it unfortunately for the main amount of a relief, it was baked into the state um, legislation that this money couldn't be used for broadband and telecommunications consistent with earlier guidance from the federal government. The new federal administration uh, issued some new guidance and said, no, you can use this for broadband and telecommunications. Too late to change the big pot of money, uh, but DHS was able to issue some guidance to the counties to say you can use housing stability services funds to provide that broadband and telecommunications assistance. I am lagging behind on these programs. Sorry, John, uh, I'll pick it up. Um, and do, if you have questions as we're going, type them into the chat and we'll try to get those answered. Um, applications, uh, and anybody from any county can go through Compass. If Compass applications aren't accepted for that county, they'll be redirected directly to that county to apply. Um, so some counties have not opted in to use the centralized Compass application, um, but either way, it's a good landing point, at least to figure out who in your local area is the contact person and agency for the program. Um, currently, uh, if you're applying through Compass, you have to apply by uh, 
you apply online and then you have to mail in your documents. Um, DHS will be rolling out an update uh, in the next month or so that will allow people to apply and so attach their documents along to that. They had to stand up the program really quickly so they didn't get that piece of the tech worked out in advance, but that's coming. Um, again, some counties not using Compass, but uh, the uh, landing page should still get you that contact list. Um, and just a note that homeowner assistance is coming soon. And so one of our biggest pieces of advice if somebody is facing utility termination is to reach out to that utility and say, this person is eligible for this program. You guys are going to get paid for your, you know, all the way back to March. Please don't terminate this person until, uh, you know, they have time to apply. Generally, when we're talking about the large utilities, they are going to postpone a termination, allowing you to get that person in for help and, and walk them through that process. I want to cover some of the customer assistance programs. Many of you have probably heard, heard this before, but it always is good for a refresher. Um, the major utilities in the Northeast, PPL, MedEd, UGI, um, uh, I think there might be some Penelac uh, in the northern tier of your service territory as well. All of them operate a customer assistance program that provides reduced uh, arrears or reduced bill, uh, a monthly uh, bill. It freezes past debt and then it allows for arrearage forgiveness over time. Um, so if somebody hasn't entered CAP yet and they have lots of arrears from um, COVID as, you know, as a result of, of uh, the pandemic, they can enroll in CAP and have all of those arrears just frozen and eligible for forgiveness over time. Time. Of course, getting a, a check written out for them is probably better. It wipes that out. But if that's not an option for them, um, they're running into other barriers, getting access to the ERAP program. Um, uh, CAP is certainly a really good option to look at. Um, there is UGI's emergency relief program. So it's actually on hold right now. They, it, the program expired, uh, but there is a petition pending before the commission that we've supported um, that would start this up again, provides a one-time grant of up to $400. This is great for all of you who are working with people or doing intake for somebody who's just over eligibility guidelines uh, for CAP or for other assistance. Um, this was a really great program that I hope will get approved by the commission soon so that they can start running it again. Provides a one-time grant up to $400, and then it also puts uh, any remaining debt into a long-term payment arrangement. Um, couple of notes. Typically, CAP customers, if they run into arrears while they're in the program, so they're in the program, it's unaffordable for them still, they fall behind, um, they typically can't get a payment arrangement. However, in lifting the moratorium, the commission just last week said that everybody would be eligible for a payment arrangement. Um, this should, right, we haven't seen the final order, but this include, should include CAP customers. Normally they wouldn't be eligible for a payment arrangement. Now they should be eligible for up to five-year payment arrangement based on their income. So um, that's one, you know, really good thing that came out of that, at least when they were lifting the moratorium, they did think that um, it was prudent to allow CAP customers to uh, have the ability catch up. Um, I will note uh, you're going to see termination notices coming through your offices. Um, don't ever just stop at the amount that's due on the termination notice. Often, especially people who were in CAP, are going to see a different number on their termination notice than they actually need to pay to stop a termination. And sometimes that difference is substantial. So it could be that they only owe to stop a termination, you know, two past due bills, right? They've got to catch up on $150. But what happens is when they go into termination, any debt that was frozen as a result of their enrollment in CAP becomes due all at once. Um, and so that's the number that shows up on their termination notice, but they can reinstate themselves into CAP by just catching up on those missed payments.
water assistance is getting better, um, especially in the Northeast. And so I have to give huge amounts of uh, uh, props to John um, for uh, working with Lehigh County over the past three years um, and uh, Lori for, uh, you know, working with us to make those connections. Um, We've worked long and hard uh, with them, and they have established a payment assistance program. So um, there is now grant assistance available up to $300 um, a year um, for somebody. They have to have paid at least $100 in the last two months, um, and they need to have an overdue bill, but then they can get some grant assistance. The other really big thing we got from Lehigh County is that they've standardized payment arrangements now. Um, and so uh, huge wins. Congratulations to John on that um, and uh, to Lori and, and anybody else who might be on this call that, that maybe helped us uh, get there with Lehigh County. But we're pre really pleased. They were really receptive. Um, and we're going to try and do that with other uh, authorities in the region. A couple of other improvements to be in my uh, uh, to keep in mind. Um, we've recently gotten some improvements to Aqua's Helping Hand program. Um, uh, they uh, now are providing uh, arrearage forgiveness of twenty five dollars with each uh, on time and in full payment. Um, so a little arrearage forgiveness there now. Uh, there's a water conservation kit that will come now um, when you get enrolled in that program. Um, and uh, John, am I missing any other? highlights to that one the uh the hardship fund which is they're still they're still rolling it out um and so the, i had marked here um that it was initially for unique hardship it was undefined um they have since at the last meeting indicated that they're using it for uh as a like a covid um covid response right now so households that have been impacted by COVID are, are eligible for the for a hardship grant. Excellent. Um, so if you're working with an Aqua customer and their programs are not very well advertised, you're going to need to ask. But we can connect you with the right people there uh, to be able to match folks up with the right programs. Um, Pennsylvania American Water, a couple of improvements there. Um, uh, the uh, wastewater assistance is now available for a 20% discount on wastewater charges, um, which have grown pretty ac astronomically over the last couple of years, um, most recently in a rate case. Um, uh, uh, so as rates go up, important to get all of our clients enrolled in, in each one of these programs. A little tip about P American Water is when you call the pro, the pro, the program administrator for dollar for is dollar energy for the help to others H two O program. Um, the first thing that they'll do is enroll somebody in the grant assistance program, um, but they don't they're not so good at offering also that somebody can enroll in the build discount program as well. So in advising clients, just make sure that you tell them. Uh, you know, you got a request uh, to also enroll in the build discount program. But there's, you know, lots of information on these slides that you can hopefully refer back to about, um, you know, what the benefits are and everything. Hardship fund grants, uh, just a note in your service territories, PPL has operation help. Um, the the uh, PPL's Operation Help Program is the only one in the state that will provide assistance to pay for other, uh, you know, heating um, related uh, utilities and deliverable fuels. So if you're a PPL customer, you may be able to get assistance through that program for a non-PPL bill, which is unique. Um, uh, both programs, PPL and UGI, sometimes will restrict their hardship fund grants for CAP customers. Um, both have assured us that they have waived those rules and are accepting um, CAP applicants for hardship fund grants to help them catch up on their CAP bills. Um, so, you know, even if somebody has been denied for a hardship fund grant, it certainly is worth following up with the agency and asking for um, uh, that to be 
another look to be taken at that application. And again, if you're running into problems, this is where John and I can be pretty helpful. Um, the utilities don't allow us to give out a, just a list of our contacts, but if any of you were to reach out to us, we could connect you to the right people. So I'm going to just breeze by LIHEAP. It is still open. I hope that all of you are well aware of it. Anybody um, that pays for uh, heat or heat-related service directly or as a portion of their rent should be, uh, you know, referred directly to LIHEAP uh, to apply as soon as possible. Um, that program is scheduled to close April 9th. Um, we are in talks with DHS to get them to ex extend the program. They have money left to continue to spend um, on LIHEAP. We have another $240 million coming to Pennsylvania for LIHEAP assistance through the most recent uh, stimulus package. Um, we are very hopeful that LIHEAP will extend um, into uh, th and through the summer um, and right into next year so that we don't go through a period where LIHEAP is unavailable. Uh, not sure yet whether DHS is going to extend it. So for now, you have to act as though it's going to close April 9th. Um, and that means everybody and anybody who might be eligible should apply. There's no harm if you apply. You might as well uh, if you think you might be eligible. Benefits are all there, 200 minimum cash grant, uh, $1,000 maximum crisis grants this year are up to $800, which is an increase over uh, standard years. Um, the eligibility is there. Uh, something to pay attention to is the cash grant eligibility is for primary or supplemental heat. Supplemental heat would be if, um, you know, their main heating system is inadequate, so they have to use plug-in space heaters or something like that. Um, uh, crisis grant you can get for your primary, secondary, or supplemental source of heat. Secondary source of heat is that other form of heat, form of uh, energy you need for your heating system to work. So if you rely on a natural gas, um, uh, you know, uh, furnace, you need electricity for your uh, furnace to work. So electricity would be your secondary heating source. So if you're facing an electricity um, shutoff, an electric shutoff, you can get a crisis grant for that electric. Um, uh, you apply through Compass. Um, so you can also get, uh, you know, paper copies. Some of you probably get, have a whole stack of them that are delivered to your office every year. Um, uh, certainly uh, getting that out to as many people as possible is uh, critical. Um, just real quick, uh, tenant eligibility. Uh, tenants um, even if heat is included in rent, are eligible for LIHEAP. So whether it is just part of rent, like their lease says, uh, or they've got an agreement that says, um, you know, you pay me $300 a month for rent and heat, um, that would be uh, an undesignated portion of your rent, so you can get LIHEAP. Um, you would only, though, if it is an undesignated portion of your rent, you would get 50% of that grant amount. But if it's a designated portion of the rent and it says you pay the utility bill, right, and the landlord tells the tenant how much that utility bill is, then it is a designated portion of your rent and you can get the full LIHEAP grant that you're entitled to. The only exception for renters that don't have a direct relationship with their utility is that if they're in public housing um, and their rent is based on a percentage of their income and includes utilities. So, um, you know, I'm in a public housing uh, uh, situation. I, I uh, pay $300 for rent and that includes heat and I get, you know, um, uh, then if, if that's based on the portion of your income, not eligible for LIHEAP. It's the only exception. Um, also, mixed status households. So uh, immigrant uh, families with mixed status certainly are eligible for LIHEAP. Um, uh, there is no prohibition. Um, the only the catch is undocumented persons will be included for calculating income and excluded for calculating household size. So if you have a four-person household, um, 
two parents undocumented, two children documented. All four would go on the application. They would include the income from the two parents, but it would be a two-person household for purposes of calculating income um, for uh, the income threshold. There is a lot more information if you go to that link on YouTube and watch our um, uh, LIHEAP uh, webinar from this fall. Um, really quick, I'm actually going to probably skip through this slide because I want to get to John's portion um, of the presentation. But there are energy efficiency programs can help massively reduce people's energy usage in their home particularly good for people who, um, you know, are living in substandard housing um, and just, you know, can't control their energy usage. Low-income people have the highest energy usage um, often um, on a per square foot basis, right? They live in smaller homes, so compared to a mansion, they're not using that amount of energy. But um, for uh, on a per square foot basis, they use a lot more because their insulation is poor, their windows are broken, they have holes in their roofs. Um, so some of the, these programs, including LIARP, can start to help to fix that. They can give new equipment that is more efficient. They can seal up the home uh, so that there's not as much air leakage. Um, and uh, you know, if you have questions about that, let us know. There's some other programs as well, the Weatherization Assistance Program, um, there's some Act 129 programs. So if you run into someone and you're looking at their bill and you're going, wow, for a two-person household, you are using tons of energy, right? My energy bill is way lower. Um, uh, give us a call and we'll help you match with some of these programs. Just want to mention that? life. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, um, it's now a good time to, I'm going to launch the poll, the first Perfect. poll. Um, I'll leave it going for about two minutes and then I'll end it. So if you're wanting CLE credit, make sure that you respond. Thank you, Tim. So don't forget to respond. Um, and while you're doing that, um, I'll give you just a a brief peek at Lifeline. Um, if you don't know about Lifeline, you may have heard it referred to as the Obama phone, um, which is always strange to me because this program has been around a lot longer than Obama was around, um, but it got the nickname uh, Obama phone. Um, People can get a subsidy from, this is a federal program. Uh, the website to apply and to find out more information is up there. You can be categorically eligible if you are enrolled in one of those programs that are listed. Um, uh, otherwise, if you prove, you know, income eligibility would be 135% of the poverty guidelines. The standard benefit is $9.25 subsidy a month. It can go to telephone, broadband, or a package um, of telephone and broadband um, uh, bundled service. It also, though, some Lifeline providers take that 925 subsidy and they go, we're just going to give you free service, right? So they give you a free handset um, and uh, they don't charge you for service. They then may charge for bells and whistles on your account, like texting, right? Which to many of us doesn't feel like a bell or a whistle. It should be a standard service. Um, there's a certain amount of service that has to be provided as kind of minimum service. Um, I could do a whole training on uh, Lifeline. Uh, we won't dig too much into it. Uh, the only other thing to keep in mind is that it's portable. So if somebody um, wants to change service providers, they can find another Lifeline provider. Um, if you do have more questions about Lifeline, connect with us offline. Um, and that is a lot of program talk, um, lots of different programs available to help people who are facing termination. Um, I'm going to turn it over to John to talk about all the legal strategies uh, that you can use in addition to the programs. Hey everybody, I'm John Sweet, uh, formerly of North Penn Legal Services, now with Polk. Uh, I wanted to talk about strategies for preventing terminations and getting clients reconnected. Um, uh, as a preliminary matter, I think I want to reiterate what, what Liz has said, um, which is if you run into these situations um, or any, any utility issue that can't be easily resolved, 
feel free to reach out to us. We encourage you to reach out to us. It's what we're here for. And it's one of the, our favorite parts of our job. So um, we, we, we're always here. Um, so not, uh, aside from that, the number one way to prevent terminations is get them into, get your client into an assistance program. Um, like Liz had discussed, uh, that can often resolve the matter, but if the if the client has is ineligible or has been kicked out of the assistance program um, and, and you need to move forward, there's a number of ways to prevent termination. Uh, we're going to run through them pretty quickly, but um, they are, for each of these, there, there could be a, a, a full training on each of these issues. Um, so again, this is gonna be a brief overview meant for issue spotting. If you have trouble with these, just feel free to reach out to us. Um, payment arrangements, medical certificates, domestic violence protections. Um, there's a four year statute of limitations and, um, and low income households can't be uh, assigned security deposits. Um, so uh, for payment arrangements, utilities can offer uh, under the Pennsylvania utility regulations as many payment arrangements as they want for any length of time. Um, and consumers have the right to negotiate for a better arrangement. Um, however, uh, they, they, the utilities do not often give affordable payment arrangements and uh, you wind up having to send your client to the PUC to get a PUC issued payment arrangement. Because um, uh, usually what the utility is gonna offer you is, a, is an IVR automatic payment arrangement, which is generally gonna be either like a 12 month payment arrangement. Um, and if your client can't afford their bill as it is, they're probably not going to be able to afford their bill plus whatever the, the arrears are um, spread into such a short time. Um, so that's why the, the, the PUC uh, has defined payment arrangement terms that it will offer if you call the Bureau of Consumer Services and request a payment arrangement through the PUC. Uh, Low-income customers um, at or below 150% of poverty can get a, up to a five-year payment arrangement. Um, so if you're looking at, uh, like Liz had said earlier, under the, the order that came out lifting the moratorium, the utilities are now going to be required to offer a five-year payment arrangement um, for the customers that are, that are at risk of termination. And then they, if they fail that terminate that payment arrangement, you, they can go to the PUC and get another payment arrangement um, of up to five years. Uh, but they only get one shot at that. Um, so you can get as many as you want through the utility. Once you go to the PUC and, and you get one payment arrangement, you fail that payment arrangement, they won't give you another payment arrangement unless there's been a, a significant change in circumstances uh, which they, they apply pretty strictly uh, to, to, big, to either the, the loss of an income earner in the household through um, death or disability or um, through a, a large swing, a, a large drop in income. And I can't remember the exact percentage, but it's, it's somewhere around like, like a 50% drop in household income or something like that. Um, so you, you can always ask for another one if, if there has been a significant change in circumstances, but there it's really hard to get a second PUC payment arrangement. Um, another caveat there is that debt accrued while in cap uh, is not usually eligible, eligible for a PUC payment arrangement, um, except for right in, in the COVID time. Now, because of this, uh, this order that lifted the moratorium, we're going to get uh, the ability for cap customers to get payment arrangements on their on their their cap arrears. Medical certificates. So, if you have a customer that has a 
serious illness or a medical condition uh, that requires serv utility service to treat that illness, they can get a medical certificate um, that's going to temporarily stop the termination for 30 days. Um, they can submit another certificate 30 more days later and another certificate 30 more days later, uh, provided they had made no payment, they had not been keeping up with their bill during that time, it will, the, the, that third medical certificate will be the last one that they're allowed to exercise. Um, if they, however, if they are able to pay their ongoing charges each month while the medical certificates are in effect, they can continue to renew their medical certificate every 30 days, as long as they keep up, as long as the, the, um, the medical condition persists and as long as they keep up with that, that the ongoing monthly charges, uh, not the back bill. Um, and of course, there's no need for the medical cert certificate if other protections apply. So if you can, if someone, if you can get someone into CAP or you can uh, exercise some of the other um, strategies that we talk about here, you don't want to waste the medical certificate because it's a limited, so you only get, you really practically only get three because it's very rare for a customer to be able to keep up with the 30 day charges. Um, so this should be held in the, in the back pocket um, as an emergency. Um, so we had heard that there was some in, uh, interest in relocation issues because of the coming end to the eviction moratorium. Um, we, have, we have a lot of people throughout the state that are uh, either behind on rent and looking to get out now um, because they know what's coming or who are going to be faced with eviction in coming months and going to be looking for another place to live and who have, may have uh, not only fallen behind on rent, but also fallen behind on their utility bills. Um, so uh, some things to remember are that the, the regular, at least the regulated utilities, the bill will follow the customer and anyone who was listed as a resident when the customer opened service or subsequently um, in, informed the utility that the person had moved in. Um, so if, if you're listed as a resident and, and the person whose name, if you have a roommate and your roommate stops paying the electric bill, uh, you're still going to be held accountable for that when you go to set up service within the same utility service territory. There is, however, for the four-year contractual statute of limitations applies to these utility, uh, debts and it runs from the date, um, the date the original account was closed. Um, and victims of domestic violence who can who provide a active PFA or another court order that clearly evidences domestic violence uh, cannot be charged for the any amount that was accrued in someone else's name. So if they were listed, if, if the bill was in their name, they're still on the hook. But if they, as in the situation that I was just talking about with the roommate or um, where they're listed as a resident in the household, they, they, if they can produce the PFA or the court order, they can't be held responsible uh, for, for the amount from the previous residence. Um, this is particularly important to protect um, victims of domestic violence who are fleeing, um, fleeing their abuser uh, and, and seek to set up service in their own name so they can't be held accountable uh, for the, the, the abuser's debts. Um, and one thing to note for CAP customers, when they're moving directly, if you have a customer who's enrolled in CAP and they're moving directly from one residence into another, that's gonna generally be a smooth transition because they're, they, they're gonna disconnect service at one household, reconnect at another. However, um, it's common for low-income customers to have some gap could be a short gap of a couple of weeks all the way up to a year between or more between residences while they are either if they you know they've been evicted or they needed to move out um, and they've been couch surfing or they stayed with family for a little while while they were looking for a new place. Uh, in those cases, 
Um, it's going to be a little harder when they go to set up service, but they should still be able to um, to get enrolled there. Um, as long as their CAP recertification date has not lapsed uh, during that gap in time. John, John there's a, oh, oh, go ahead. I was, there's a question from Carol uh, Schoner. Um, are other forms of documentation acceptable for domestic violence victims, like a letter from a DV program? I would say I, I would defer to Liz. Liz is really an expert on this, uh, but I, it's it's hard. It's a hard sell. Um, I would say I, I would try it. Uh, it would depend on the utility, but for the utilities that we that we deal with on a regular basis, they usually require. It's hard. It's a hard sell to even get them to take some types of court orders. Yeah, and I mean, I'll just add that. I mean, that's exactly right. It you, you should always ask um, because you won't get anything if you don't ask. But as far as getting a, a survivor out from underneath the debt of a third party, um, if it was accrued, I mean, generally we are in a state that has occupant liability. So if you live with somebody at the time that the debt is accrued, you're both jointly liable for that debt, and they will go after whoever pops back up on their system first. So that is the person that they will transfer the debt to if you are living in the house at the time. This presents a huge problem, as Carol points out. Um, uh, well, it suggests it. I mean, it's a it's a big problem for victims of domestic violence in transition. Um, they pop up next. They can't, you know, on the system next. They can't connect which means they can't get a new safe home um, until they're out from under that utility debt. Um, two points of clarification there, um, you know, the PFA or another court order showing evidence of domestic violence is required for that third party debt, but it's not required for the commit for the utility to, to exercise its discretion. So as John said earlier, utilities have wild amounts of discretion. They can enter whatever payment arrangements they want. Um, so, you know, asking, right, uh, and for advocates to reach out on behalf of a survivor, if the survivor is not able to eliminate that debt from their bill, um, asking for more lenient payment arrangements. One thing we've been really successful in doing in representing victims of domestic violence in utility proceedings um, is to, if they are in transition and trying to set up service at a new address, but the utility debt is preventing them from doing so. If you call the utility and say, I'm working with a victim of domestic violence, they've got this debt. They're, you know, they aren't say, they're not saying they're not uh, liable for it, but can we uh, get their service on and then get them immediately enrolled in CAP, for instance? That will uh, put that debt, um, you know, it'll make it eligible for forgiveness over time. It'll give them a discount and they can go forward. We've had a couple of cases where, um, you know, we're before a housing authority um, and the housing authority has rejected an application um, because there's utility debt or they've, you know, put them uh, off for receiving housing assistance until they deal with that debt. Well, then working with the housing authority and saying, actually, if we can just work with the utility, the utility has agreed that they'll turn service on in order to get, you know, they'll put them in a program right away so that they can deal with that debt. Because um, it's really chicken and the egg. You can't get an address until you've dealt with this debt, but you can't deal with the debt until you get an, an, an address and, and an account set up. So, um, you know, that takes an advocate to be able to do that, uh, resolve that chicken and egg problem for a survivor in particular. Um, but same kind of uh, theories apply when you're working with anyone uh, who's relocating and in transition. All right, thanks. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk briefly about tenants' utility rights and unregulated utilities. Um, this is going to be a very brief overview. Uh, we have, if you have, if you want to know more about this, we have uh, full-length presentations that we can um, provide to you. But uh, just briefly, the uh, the tenants' utility rights. Um, come into play where you have a tenant who is the person who is receiving utility service, but the landlord is the named customer of the utility. 
um, creates a big problem where the landlord stops paying the bill. They seek to terminate the tenant who may or may not ever know that the bill was overdue, um, let alone that they were at risk of termination. Um, in these cases, the utility must provide, um, so to any household that's reasonably, for those reasons, the utility must provide 30 days notice to any unit that is reasonably likely to be tenant occupied. Um, so they, the utility should not be requiring uh, confirmation that a tenant lives there before it issues this notice. Um, but if it does, if, if a tenant gets terminated um, due to non-payment by the landlord, they should have the immediate right to contact the utility, tell them a tenant lives there, they should reconnect service and serve that household uh, with a 30-day notice. Um, and during that 30 days, they have the right, the opportunity to collect enough money to pay the past 30 days bill. And if they can pay the, they can, they have the right to continued service. If they pay the, the amount equal to the 30 days charges in the month before the termination notice went out. Um, and they can continue to pay that. And then the utility has to tell them the ongoing 30 days charges for every month going forward after that. Um, and then the, the tenant can pay those 30 day monthly charges every day going forward and continue service. Um, this way the utility gets its money for the ongoing charges. Um, it can, if it's an unregulated utility, uh, municipal authority, municipal corp corporation, they can lien the property uh, for the back balance from the landlord and, and get paid for the service that they're provided going forward. Um, the tenant also has the right, but not the obligation to switch service to switch the named service um, into their own name at the, um, in these situations. Um, the landlord, there's also provisions in here, and this is in both Ustra. So Ustra applies to uh, unregulated municipal authorities, municipal corporations, the discontinuance of service to lease premises act applies to regulated utilities, um, gas, electric, and the larger water companies, they are both almost identical with very small, very small differences. Um, the regulated, the, the discontinuance of service lease premises act does provide a little bit more protection on some, on um, foreign load. They have a foreign load protection where uh, if your unit is receiving, if your unit, if you're, meter is being charged for service that's being provided to another unit. Um, you can have that, you can have your bill switched back into the landlord's name until they fix the wiring or piping issue that's causing that charge. Um, but that is not available to the unregulated, customers of unregulated utilities uh, through Ustra. Um, uh, both Ustra and Discontinuance Service Lease Premises Act uh, prevent a landlord from constructively evicting his tenants by calling the utility and, and requesting that service be voluntarily disconnected. In those cases, the utility must require uh, from the landlord a notarized form swearing under penalty of perjury that the unit's unoccupied. Um, so if a tenant unit, if this happens and you contact the utility and they didn't get that form, um, then they should reconnect immediately um, and whether or not they have that form on file if your tenant if if the unit gets disconnected in these circumstances the tenant has the right the same rights to continued service that they would have had had the landlord um, stopped paying the bill so they can continue to um, pay the third the 30 days ongoing charges each month and continue service um, and one and John, other, they can deduct it from rent. I, I don't know if you said I that piece, but I love that piece. They can deduct it from rent and they can't retaliate and you all can go after them for attorney's fees um, if your program allows it. That's right. And it can't be waived in a lease. Um, 
So any of those those broad waivers of like I you know I waive the right to sue my landlord for blah 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 that those generally don't apply. But even specific waivers on these um, they are invalid. Um, and one other note: I, sometimes we get cases where the the customer or the landlord falls behind on a sewer bill. Um, and the sewer bill under the Water Services Act, the sewer company can contact the water company and request that service be disconnected, that water service be disconnected for non-payment of the sewer bill. In those cases, they, the, the water utility still must follow Ustra. The statute says the water company must follow Ustra. It creates a big headache to figure out who really the, the burden is on because the, the sewer company has the records, um, the water company has the obligation under the statute. Um, so it's a, it's a difficult situation, but, but the gist of it is somebody's got to provide the Ustra notice and the tenant has the right if they pay the ongoing 30 day sewer charges to continued water service. And John, I'll take this, I'll just note, you're going to run into problems where water authorities and sewer authorities think they're not subject to this law. So, um, you know, but it takes then figuring out who the local solicitor is, uh, reaching them and uh, reading them sometimes, <laughs> literally reading them the statute. And John can, um, uh, has some experience <laughs> in that uh, realm, but you know, if you're running into that problem, that really is, it's just about tracking down the solicitor because uh, the folks in the front office, sometimes it's one part-time person, right? They've never heard of Ustra. They've never he heard of that. All they know is that they're an unregulated municipal authority, not subject in their mind to any rules or regulations governing turnoff. So you have to do a little education around uh, those rights. Yeah, and we we are seeing at, at Pope, right? We have a utility. We do have a utility hotline um, that Kristen runs, and we've been seeing a larger, a huge percentage of our, a huger percentage of our cases um, being these 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 issues, these unregulated uh, utility issues, uh, specifically landlords trying to constructively evict their um, their tenants by by requesting shutoffs or they, they let the tenants not paying the rent and so the landlord decides to stop paying the water bill um, and so um, we we're dealing with these on um, an almost daily basis so if you uh, need some help reaching out to um, a solicitor locating a solicitor explaining the law to the solicitor if you again uh, reach out to us and, and we'll get on a call this is a really nice flow chart that we got from the Pennsylvania Municipal Authorities Association that explains the termination process for unregulated utilities. Um, and so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. I, it, it has a lot to do with some stuff that I, that I explained on the last slide, but if you're curious about where the Water, where the water Services Act comes into play, um, that's here where it, uh, where it explains how they must follow the utility, right, uh, utility Service Tenants Rights Act. John, I'm going to launch the second poll. Um, and just so you know, it is now 3 o'clock. I will wrap up very quickly. Um, yes, I am actively participating. And uh, OK, so. Unregulated utility disputes uh, and due process. So aside from the U Utility Service Tenants Rights Act and the Water Services Act, um, the municipal authorities and municipal corporations are local agencies under Pennsylvania's administrative agency law. They must provide notice and an opportunity to, to be heard uh, before they can deprive someone of their rights. Um, and so what that means in the context of unregulated water utilities is that they have to have some type of formal dispute process for the customers to dispute their bills. Um, and if a customer initiates a dispute on an amount that the utility cannot terminate for that amount, 
Um, so if the customer, so something you have to watch out for though, is if you're only disputing half the bill, say the customer admits they owe half the bill, but they're disputing that they owe the other half, they still must pay the undisputed amount to avoid termination. Um, we had, Liz and I had some discussion earlier about whether it's worth initiating a dispute for failure to offer a payment arrangement. Um, and it may be worth a shot. There, they, there's no statutory obligation that requires unregulated utilities to offer payment arrangements the same way that, that um, uh, regulated utilities must offer them. However, um, there are some equity concerns and um, it, you know, it, it could be worth a shot. Uh, but um, another good point is um, for, the, for the right to avoid termination due to the dispute, it must be a good faith dispute. Um, so you should, you must have some type of good faith argument on why, you know, why this customer should not be terminated, um, and why the utility should have offered a payment arrangement. And that could be like, you know, a leak in the system and it caused a huge spike in their bill. That happens a lot for low income people, uh, whose, you know, water systems are older and, uh, they can't really afford plumbers to come in and, and fix a running toilet, right? Um, right. Yeah, leaks are, I, leaks are a big thing. Um, and, and that's definitely a good faith, that's definitely a good faith dispute, especially, um, <laughs> going down a rabbit, especially sewer leaks that are beyond the meter uh, or leaks that are beyond the meter, um, they create a, um, a problem on sewer bills, right? They leak beyond the meter. Uh, a lot of sewer companies bill based on the water meter. So if you have a, a water leak that's after the, the, um, the water meter, it's gonna get, it's gonna show up on the water meter, but it never went through the sewer. So technically you shouldn't owe that money to the sewer company, but um, good luck selling that to your local sewer authority. Um, Susan Yeager uh, uh, chimes in that faulty meters as well, and that's absolutely right. There, there are faulty meters and you should have the right to request a meter test um, if uh, the, the client thinks the meter's not working, so. Uh, two more quick points here. Um, so the, if you, your dispute, if you um, are unable to get a resolution through the, the utilities dispute process, you can appeal that to the Court of Common Pleas. Um, and the most important thing to remember when dealing with unregulated utilities is that negotiations are going to be your strongest uh, asset. And so you important to maintain a working and workable relationship. Um, the frontline staff at these places is often very nasty and very discourteous. Um, and you just can't, you can't play into it because you're going to be going to them hat in hand over and over again and, and asking for, um, for help for your clients that is not going, you know, that, they, that you technically really have no leverage. Um, and also be sure to inform them, um, especially now with the emergency rental and utility assistance coming, um, just, be, just be sure to keep the, keep the utility in the loop and let them know that there's money coming and when it's gonna get there. Um, and here briefly on regulated utility complaints, I think the gist of here is if you file, a, if you call the, the PUC's Bureau of Consumer Services and file a, a um, informal complaint at, at least the day before termination. They'll put a hold on the termination until the dispute is resolved. Um, that can get your client much needed time to um, come up with money, resolve it, and resolve the dispute uh, with the utility. Um, there is also a, a formal complaint process, uh, and which if you if you lose your informal complaint, you can always um, file an in, a formal complaint on that, or you can jump straight to the formal complaint. Um, for the most part, we recommend starting out at the informal complaint, unless there's some other reason um, that the informal complaint is not going to work out for you. Um, and now we are on to the question and answer period. Thank you all. 
Um, and there were a couple questions in the chat that I answered, uh, but you know, for the benefit of those who are not uh, in able to review that, I know there's at least one one person on the phone. Um, I just want to clarify. Uh, as the first question, there were kind of two questions about how the how LIHEAP works for tenants who don't have a direct utility payment. Um, and so I think that warrants a little bit further uh, clarification. Um, uh, just want to, you know, when a tenant applies for LIHEAP, um, if it is not part, like if they don't have a direct relationship with their utility, but they are responsible for heating related service, um, they can still get a grant. It will be 50, if it's an undesignated portion of their rent, they will get 50% of that grant. It will be in a check that comes directly to them. If it is a designated portion of their rent, they are eligible for the full IHEAP amount, it will come to them. If they are a public housing recipient and they their um, heat is an undesignated portion of their rent and they uh, are receiving housing assistance that is income based. So if their income goes up, the amount they pay towards housing goes up then they are not eligible for LIHEAP. And that is the only exception for tenants who's, uh, who don't have a direct relationship with the utility. Um, so they're wonderful. Keep the questions coming. There's a question um, uh, from Susan. I deal with two boroughs in Carbon County that are not regulated by the PUC. Uh, what can be done, if anything? Um, so my question, Susan, if you can clarify, are we talking about a water authority or are we talking about one of the um, uh, unregulated electric municipal co-ops? Both. This is tough. Um, you know, the best thing I can say to do is create a relationship now over at that borough. Talk to them about how you can uh, triage cases that are going to come through. And I would recommend talking to them in their language, um, right? And their language is they need revenue coming in the door. Um, and so, you know, with all of the assistance coming um, currently with the emergency rental assistance, soon to be coming with the um, homeowner assistance that was in the most recent package. Um, and there is also an additional water and wastewater assistance program we didn't talk about today, but that is coming. Um, it's taking a little longer as part of the December stimulus, um, but the funding hasn't been released to the states yet through uh, uh, the federal HHS. Um, that program we're hopeful will be up in the next couple of months. Um, so really, I mean, if you can negotiate with those folks at the that county level, um, that's the best, right? Figure out if, you know, you can get them to either continue a moratorium for a short period of time till the programs are up and running. If you can get the local county that's administering your emergency rental assistance to talk to the authority, even better, right? Um, in which case there's nothing that prohibits the local authority or uh, you know, municipal or bor borough utility from talking to the county and saying, here are all of the people that we have that are past due. Uh, let's reach out to them with, you know, and get them to come in and apply for that um, emergency rental assistance program. So, um, you know, I think there's avenues for advocates. Of course, John, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about what can be done, um, but I think all those uh, water um, uh, protections are something. Well, yeah, the water protection, it sounds like, and Susan, if you want to unmute, um, I'm just wondering if you, are you talking about that you have two boroughs with a lot of faulty meters or are they just, or are there other issues? Is that the issue that you're asking about? Or just, no. but yeah she says no oh. in the chat i think the faulty meters were in response to an earlier question john 
Okay. It's not that the note didn't show up in my, uh, so, um, because what I was going to say about that, or really like, so the, another part of the, the Ustra um, issue is that the utilities can still be sued for unfair debt collection practices for collecting on, um, and, and actually I, I would defer to those of you um, who are more averse in consumer law to this. I know that there's a, there's a distinction between who's technically a debt collector under that law, um, but there are unfair trade, pra unfair trade practices, um, uh, ramifications and unfair debt collection practice ramifications um, for instances where utilities seek to collect um, debts that they're not entitled to. Um, and so we have some sample pleadings. We typically provide those, but um, they're available. I think we've distributed them actually to North Penn. Um, so if you look in the, in the sample plead, in the sample use for pleadings that we circulated, there's also um, unfair trade practices, I believe, um, claims in there. I'm not sure actually now that I talk about it, I think we might have taken those out. Um, but yeah, there's, I, you know, I, again, that like there, uh, there's the process of the dispute and, and you're gonna have to take them to common pleas court um, you know, on, on these statutory issues. Um, and there's a couple other issues that if they're happening and they're systemic, like the kinds of fees, right? We've seen a couple of municipal authorities recently charging, you know, $15 to send a letter of termination. Um, if that's happening, you know, it, it may be a, a a suit that we can bring against them for, you know, under unfair trade practices. I think I saw some of our partners at CJP on too. They might be interested in some kind of class action like that if you're seeing astronomical fees. And we have seen some of that across the state. Um, there is another question um, whether the presentation is going to be archived. Um, and thanks, Tim, for responding. I'll just make sure it's in the recording. Presentation is being recorded and will be available later. And I'll note for those of you who are not part of North Penn, and if we don't have a relationship, or if we do, if you wanted a, you know, to put together another presentation for a separate group of folks, um, just reach out to John and I. Um, John or I, uh, or send an email. If you send an email to pulp at palpatpalegalaid.net, it'll get to John, me, and the rest of our uh, pretty small team. Um, and so that then you'll get a response from the first person. There's a couple of resources available. We have some one-pagers. Um, on our uh, website, which is up here. If you follow us on Facebook, you'll be able to get uh, resources as we release them. Um, we also do, John mentioned, we have an emergency utility hotline for cases that you're not able to triage. Um, uh, and then, you know, if you are working with, with a, a client and you need just some technical assistance, um, we're happy to provide it. Uh, give John or I a call or shoot an email to our general pulp email. 